This is experiment 14 in inorganic chemistry. It is the last in a series of laboratories. In this course we attempted to get a survey of the more common elements in the periodic table and study their chemistry. It's certainly not possible in just 14 weeks, but we have got a pretty good overview of that. In this last experiment we're going to look at some chemistry related to copper, nickel, and zinc. And this is part A. In part A we're looking at a sequence of nickel-2 reactions. Let's look at the lab report that you're going to fill in. You're going to start with a solution of nickel-2 nitrate which gives us nickel in solution. You're going to precipitate it as the carbonate. You'll notice there's a place for you to write the formula, note the color, and then write the chemical name. The carbonate precipitate will be redissolved with nitric acid and then reprecipitated as the hydroxide. The hydroxide actually dissolves in ammonia, forming an amine complex of nickel. So nickel bonds more strongly than hydroxide and displaces the hydroxide. Finally, we'll add another ligand, dimethylglyoxime, which displaces the ammonia and forms a complex. Let's take a look at the solubility table for just a moment. Now, nickel is not on the solubility table, but notice that carbonate is, and we're told that all carbonates are insoluble, except when combined with group 1A ions or ammonium, and so certainly with nickel it will be insoluble. Similarly for hydroxide. The hydroxide of nickel 2 would also be insoluble. It's not one of these exceptions. With respect to the chemistry of nickel, on page 3, You'll see the amine complex, its stoichiometry that we formed during this reaction. You'll also see the reaction for precipitation of hydroxide. And here is that interesting ligand, dimethylglyoxime, DMGH for short. Notice it is a bidentate ligand, so each of these ligands has two nitrogens with pairs of electrons to donate and, and so a pair of these make a total of four bonds to nickel and forms a very strong complex which is a brilliant red or pink in color and this complex has been around for decades it uh, is quite visible even at very low concentrations of nickel in the part per million or part per billion level and so it's been used as a basis for a spectrum photometric test to identify low levels of nickel for a long time. Okay, well let's look at the reactions for this test. We start with nickel-2 nitrate. Next, sodium carbonate is added. That should form the insoluble carbonate of nickel. Nitric acid is added uh, dropwise, just enough to dissolve the precipitate and put nickel back in solution. Sodium hydroxide is next. Another hydroxide precipitate. Next we'll add 7 molar ammonia and the ammonia binds quite strongly so it will actually displace the hydroxide solubilizing and forming an amine complex of nickel. Colors changed as well. And it's mostly dissolved. And we'll finish with dimethylglyoxine forms a very strong complex and we get the characteristic pink red color of the nickel DMG complex
experiment 14 part B we're going to look at a sequence of reactions with the copper 2 ion and let's head straight down to the lab report and look at that quickly we are going to start with a solution of copper 2 nitrate which will give us some copper 2 ion in solution we'll precipitate that copper 2 ion as the carbonate and there's location for you to write the formula the color and name the compound We'll dissolve the precipitate with ammonia, forming a soluble amine complex of copper. We will then add some HCl, and that'll neutralize the ammonia, forming ammonium ion, which is not a ligand. And so chloride winds up being a ligand, bonding with the copper to form a tetrachlorocuprate complex. And then finally, we're going to reduce copper to to copper one using some sodium iodide. Let's look first at the solubility then we'll come back to this reduction step last. So here again is the solubility table. The carbonate of copper is not listed as an exception so certainly it will be insoluble. The chemistry of copper is discussed on page 5 and you see the formation of the amine complex of copper here, its stoichiometry and charge. In the last part of the experiment we're going to have copper 2 ion. We'll mix it with some iodide and some iodine will be formed, that is iodide oxidized to iodine as copper 2 ion is reduced to copper 1 solid. It's kind of a reddish color. Look at the reduction potential of copper. Copper 1 to copper is 0.52 volts, copper 2 to copper 1 is 0.1. It's a moderately strong oxidizer. At the same time, iodide is going to be oxidized to iodine. If you look at these potentials, you can see it's barely going to work. Mind you that these potentials are dependent upon concentration as well. We can make sure that we force this to go by adjusting concentrations. Okay, so let's watch these reactions. For the copper sequence reaction, we start with copper 2 nitrate. I'm going to add some sodium carbonate, and copper is insoluble with carbonate, forming a precipitate as expected. Now rather than acidifying to dissolve the carbonate, this time we're going to add ammonia directly. The nitrogen in ammonia bonds quite strongly. The nitrogen will displace the carbonate. Forming a soluble amine complex color is a deep blue. It's described as being a royal blue. It's pretty much solubilized. Next we'll add 6 molar HCl. The HCl will neutralize the ammonia and form ammonium ion. Now ammonium ion does not have a non-bonded pair of electrons to act as a Lewis base electron donor or ligand to the copper. So the ammonia is released or neutralized and in its place chloride will donate as a ligand to the copper forming a cuprate complex. Some dichloromethane as a test for iodine, followed by sodium iodide. Now the copper 2 ion should oxidize some of that iodide to iodine, and if it does, the iodine will collect in the uh, organic layer and appear as a pink color. So there it is. Looks like I didn't add quite enough copper to see the copper 1 iodide precipitate. Uh, nonetheless, the oxidation is seen to occur. Experiment 14, Part C. 
the weathering of copper. How does copper weather? Take a look at this picture here. Roofs such as that of the Parliament building that are covered in copper or copper alloys like brass over time, months or years, develop this green oxidation coating and that is called copper 2 carbonate hydroxide. Common name is verdigris. Carbon dioxide in the air plus water oxidizes slowly. Um, it's a protective coating and some people consider it attractive. The Statue of Liberty donated by France to the USA in 1886 supposedly is made of brass on the surface and it over time has turned green. So it's a natural slow weathering process that copper and its alloys undergoes. We're going to try and do this in an accelerated fashion in the lab. At least we'll simulate it. So let's watch and I'll explain as we do it. Here's a piece of copper foil folded into the shape of a boat so it'll hold a bit of liquid. We'll add some 3 molar nitric acid to oxidize a bit of the copper. A combination of nitric acid and heat. Ouch, that's hot quickly. It doesn't take long before we start to see some discoloration, oxidation products from air, from the nitric acid, and of course there's CO2 given off by the flame, so likely we're seeing some green carbonate of copper forming there. Some would consider that decorative. It's important not to overheat this or it just goes black. So there it is, the accelerated weathering of copper. In part D, we're going to look at the electrochemical activity of silver and copper and zinc to a lesser extent. Let's take a look at the activity series for these ions and elements. So zinc, you see, is above hydrogen on the activity series, which means that zinc is a pretty active metal. Reducing zinc ion to zinc metal is unfavorable. One would have to apply at least 0.76 volts or greater to force the reduction of zinc ion to zinc metal. The reverse reaction is actually favorable. Copper and silver are below hydrogen on the activity series. In their case is the opposite. Uh, copper 2 ion gaining electrons, that is the reduction of copper 2 to copper metal, is quite favorable. That means that copper would prefer to exist as the element. Likewise, silver 1 reduced to silver metal. Its reduction potential is plus 0.8 volts. So what this means is that silver ion and copper 2 ion are in fact oxidizers whereas a zinc metal is a reducing agent. So if silver ion is a stronger oxidizer than copper 2 or zinc 2 that means that silver ion would take electrons from copper metal and be reduced to silver at the expense of copper being oxidized to copper 2. Similarly, silver ion would oxidize zinc metal to zinc plus 2. That would be a very favorable reaction. Similarly, uh, copper 2 ion is a stronger oxidizer than zinc. And so copper 2 ion will oxidize zinc to zinc plus 2. Copper 2 ion will take electrons from the zinc, and that should be a favorable reaction. Since we're talking about this, let's look at an important application. You'll often see that ferrous metals are coated with zinc. And zinc is often used as what's called a sacrificial anode to protect ferrous metals. Do you recall what an anode is? An anode is the electrode where oxidation occurs. And so zinc is preferentially oxidized to iron. So take a look at iron. Iron is a fairly reactive metal as well. It would preferentially exist as the ion. In fact, it takes an applied voltage to keep it as the element. And it is normally oxidized in an oxidizing environment. So ferrous alloys are often 
coated with zinc to protect them. Then might, you might wonder, well, that doesn't make sense, does it? If zinc is more readily oxidized than iron, how does that protect the iron? Well, in fact, it does, because when iron oxidizes, the iron oxide flakes off easily, exposing fresh metal, and oxidation continues. But when zinc is oxidized, and it's oxidized more readily than iron, it forms an impervious zinc oxide layer that protects what's beneath from further oxidation. A piece of trivia I just checked the web for. The global cost of corrosion is estimated to be two and a half trillion dollars annually. This is big business. Here's some industrial equipment that is made of a ferrous alloy and suffering some corrosion. That's an expensive replacement. Here's some rusted steel fence and here's zinc coated steel fencing and zinc coating is referred to as galvanizing. So in this experiment we're going to take some copper wire and put it in a test tube of some silver ion and see if there's a reaction. We'll take some zinc metal foil, put it in a test tube of copper 2 ion and look for a reaction. And we'll take some copper wire and put it in a test tube with some zinc ion and look for a reaction. So let's study these reactions and draw some conclusions. I've scaled up the reaction a bit to make it more visible but the same reactions are occurring here. And the beaker on the far left is a blue salt, copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate. And in the beaker to its immediate right is a clear blue solution of copper 2-ion. And the beaker on the far right is a white salt, zinc sulfate. And in the beaker to its immediate left is a clear colorless solution of zinc ion. In the solution of zinc ion, it place a piece of copper metal. Hmm, no reaction yet. And in the solution of blue copper 2 ion, we place a piece of zinc metal. The surface of the zinc immediately starts to darken. What's happening here? Recall that copper 2 ion is an oxidizer. It's taking electrons from the surface of the zinc metal and being deposited as copper metal on the surface of the zinc. At the same time, zinc metal is being oxidized, forming zinc ion going into solution. Still no reaction at the surface of the copper, but the reaction continues at the surface of the zinc as more copper is plated. After some time, a large deposit of copper, it even starts to take on the salmon color of copper that's characteristic of it. And notice that the blue color is fading as the copper plates out a solution. And notice that the zinc metal is thinned out as it's slowly dissolving. So we can say that in the beaker on the left. Copper ion oxidized zinc metal to zinc plus 2 ion. Or we can say that zinc metal reduced copper 2 ion to copper metal. In the beaker on the right, we could see that copper metal could not reduce zinc ion, or we could say that zinc ion could not oxidize copper metal. In the second part of this experiment, copper metal is placed in a solution of silver ion. The surface of the copper metal immediately starts to darken. Recall that silver ion is a stronger oxidizer than copper ion. So silver ion oxidizes the copper metal. It takes electrons from it. The silver ion deposits or plates as silver metal on the surface of the copper. At the same time, the copper metal is being oxidized. It's losing electrons. It's going into solution, forming the blue copper 2 ion. After some time, you can see the large deposit of silver metal on the surface of the copper. You can also see that the solution has turned blue as copper metal has dissolved and gone into solution forming copper 2 ion. So we can say that silver ion oxidized copper metal to copper plus 2 ion. We could also say that copper metal reduced silver ion to silver metal and both are occurring simultaneously.
Experiment 14, Part E. We're going to look further at the electrochemistry of copper 2 ion and silver ion. This time we will investigate an old qualitative test for aldehydes. Let me illustrate down here. So this aldehyde, you'll learn about this in organic chemistry, is fairly easy to oxidize to the carboxylic acid. Notice it's got one more oxygen and the aldehyde does, so that's oxidation. It can be brought about by mild oxidizers like copper 2 or silver 1. So in this example, the aldehyde, ethanol or acid aldehyde, is oxidized to acetic acid. Now this is carried out in basic solution and so the acid is deprotonated to the acetate ion. Now in order to do this in basic solution, there's a bit of a problem. Copper 2 precipitates in basic solution. We'd like to have copper 2 ion in solution. So what's used is a mild base called tartrate. So this is sodium potassium tartrate. Sodium potassium tartrate. And tartrate is the conjugate base of tartaric acid in the same way that acetic acid can be deprotonated to make acetate similarly tartaric acid can be deprotonated to make tartrate and tartrate is basic enough that it provides the alkalinity we need for the reaction but it won't precipitate the copper and since we're talking about it tartaric acid is a common chemical even in the kitchen it is added as a flavoring agent in sour candies and desserts so an aldehyde with copper 2 ion is oxidized to an, the carboxylic acid which forms the carboxylate acetate in this case in solution. In the process copper 2 is reduced to copper 1 and we'll see the formation of copper 1 oxide which is a reddish brown precipitate. Another way to accomplish this, another way to identify an aldehyde is to use silver instead of copper. Silver ion is even a stronger oxidizer than copper 2, so silver ion will oxidize the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid similarly. Silver ion has the same limitation as copper ion. It's insoluble in base. But we can take advantage of the fact that ammonia forms a very strong soluble coordination complex with silver, that's its formation constant, it's very strong, and so we can get silver into basic solution using ammonia and that'll provide the oxidation that we need. Now the neat part about this reaction is then as the silver ion is reduced to silver metal, if the reaction is carried out with careful attention to concentrations and the glassware is quite clean, the reaction proceeds slowly and it deposits silver over the surface of the test tube and it forms a perfect silver mirror. It's kind of fun to watch. Let's take a look at that reaction. This is Failing's test. Failing's solution A is simply copper to sulfate and Failing's solution B is sodium potassium tartrate, a mild base. We're trying to keep that copper in solution. Notice there is some precipitation going on, but the dark blue color formation indicates to me that there's a coordination complex formed, and that should keep enough copper in solution to carry out the oxidation of the acid aldehyde. Now, acid aldehyde is a very unpleasant smelling chemical, so this is definitely a fumid reaction. Looks like it doesn't really want to dissolve, so we'll give it a mix and then put it in a hot water bath for 10 or 15 minutes. Here it is after a little while. Notice the blue color has changed to a rusty copper 1 oxide. Uh, we don't have a precipitate that's clearly visible. It's suspended, but definitely evidence of reaction. This is Tollin's test. Instead of using copper 2 ion as the oxidizer, we're using silver ion. We're adding a drop or two of sodium hydroxide. It precipitates as silver hydroxide, but that is an unstable 
compound and it immediately decomposes into silver oxide and water. Now we're going to add ammonia, uh, drop-wise, just enough to dissolve the silver, forming the soluble diamine silver complex. If you add too much ammonia, the reaction proceeds too quickly. We don't get a beautiful mirror deposit, so it's important to just add just enough ammonia to dissolve the silver and no more. Looks like it's just about dissolved. Now we'll add the acid aldehyde, dropper two. This one's done at room temperature. Silver iron is a stronger oxidizer. Notice it's already starting to darken. We'll let that stand for 15 minutes or so and check it again. Here it is after a little time. Notice the silver mirror starting to form on the surface of the test tube. So silver iron's been reduced it's oxidized acid aldehyde to acetate. Here's a final look at the finished silver deposit on the surface of the test tube. A beautiful silver mirror. Experiment 14, part F. We're going to do some ancient alchemy and turn copper into silver and gold. What's the chemistry behind this? Well, we're going to take some zinc and it dissolve it or oxidize it in some sodium hydroxide, boiling sodium hydroxide, and form tetrahydroxozincate, which is soluble. In the process, water will be reduced to produce hydrogen gas. And then this tetrahydroxozincate ion is redeposited on a copper penny, and so it looks like silver. Our penny looks like a dime. Then we'll take some of those silvery pennies and put them in a, a low temperature flame and the zinc and copper, copper from the penny, zinc from the coating will alloy or amalgamate to form brass and the brass looks like gold. So here's copper plus zinc which looks like silver alloy to make brass. And spoiler alert here is the boiling sodium hydroxide with the pennies in it. You can see them already coated in silver. And then after a bit of heating, some of our silver turns to gold. This is one experiment. I can hardly get the students out of the lab. After two hours, they're still making tons of silver and gold. Let's take a look at this experiment. In the beaker, we've got six molar sodium hydroxide. To that, we're adding granular zinc. Now, 6 molar sodium hydroxide, when it's hot, is not something you want on your skin or in your eyes. This is definitely a wear gloves and safety glasses experiment. These are Canadian pennies. Where do you find pennies anymore? Look how quickly the surface of the copper is being plated with zinc. You can also see some hydrogen gas being liberated as water is reduced while the zinc is oxidized. We'll boil this for a couple of minutes. It doesn't take very long at all. The surface of the copper is coated with a silver coating of zinc. Drop them into a beaker of cold water to wash them off. And there's our loot. Silver coins. Well, actually zinc, but it sounds better if I say silver. I'm going to convert our silver into gold now. We'll heat it in a cool Bunsen burner flame. And zinc and copper amalgamate or alloy producing brass. Well, looks like gold. We'll call it gold. That flame is pretty hot. 
It's like toasting a marshmallow. If you leave it in too long, uh, bad things happen, so that's why I keep moving it around. There it is, silver and gold. Now I'm overheating this one a bit. You can see it start to discolor. And, oh, that's not so good. So I'm actually melting this penny. Better luck next time. So here's our loot. Silver and gold and one burnt penny. Experiment 14, part G. This is the last part of the last experiment of the course. The amphoteric nature of zinc hydroxide. Like the hydroxides of aluminum and tin 2 and lead 2 and chromium 3, the hydroxide of zinc is amphoteric. That is, it will dissolve in an acid or a base. In this experiment, you're going to take a small beaker and add some zinc nitrate solution and some universal indicator. We'll stir it and measure the pH and add six molar sodium hydroxide and we'll see zinc hydroxide come out of solution. But as we keep adding sodium hydroxide, it redissolves because zinc hydroxide is amphoteric, it dissolves in base. Estimate the pH at which zinc hydroxide precipitate redissolves. Then continue stirring but add six molar nitric acid, lowering the pH. You'll see the precipitate, it will reappear but eventually as you keep adding acid and the pH keeps dropping the precipitate will dissolve estimate the pH at which zinc hydroxide redissolves. On page 7 you'll find the reactions for this here's zinc precipitating as the hydroxide here's the zinc hydroxide solid redissolving as the soluble tetrahydroxo zinc 8 ion. Let's watch this reaction. This is zinc nitrate we'll find that the solution is distinctly acidic. This should not come as a surprise since we've learned previously that solutions of metal cations with a charge greater than one, that is plus two, plus three, plus four, are in fact acidic. And the higher the charge, the more acidic they are. Next we're going to add some six molar sodium hydroxide and raise the pH little at a time and already you start to see a haziness as some zinc hydroxide begins to come out of solution. Now we're going to speed this up a little bit. As we add more and more sodium hydroxide the pH rises and the zinc hydroxide flock becomes denser and denser. A little more color here. But as we continue to add sodium hydroxide, eventually the flock lightens again. At a high pH, it starts to actually redissolve, forming a soluble tetrahydroxo-zincate coordination complex. And there it goes, pH 12, 7-ish. All right, so let's now add nitric acid dropwise, and we'll bring the pH back down nitric acid will dissolve the excess hydroxide, destroying the hydroxo-zincate complex, precipitating zinc hydroxide. But when the pH gets low enough, the zinc hydroxide itself will redissolve, forming zinc ion, which will be clear and colorless. Colorless other than for the sake of the pH indicator. Alright, so that's it. That's the end of experiment 14, and this is the last experiment in this inorganic chemistry course. I trust that you learned some good fundamental chemistry in this course.